Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis Show. We are a father-son podcast where we talk with other lifelong learners about making an impact and solving problems. And today we got our good friend Hallie Evelyn. And I had to put a I had to put the stopper. I had to call time out in the green room because <laughs> She and Camden were going down the road, and we were <laughs> squeezing the juice. And I was like, "Dadgummit, y'all got to stop right now because I want other people to know these stories and what's going on." How you doing today, young lady? I'm wonderful, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, guys. Hey, we're happy to have you. We're happy to have you. Uh, we'll come back to what we were talking about in the green room, but. I, I, as I was doing my research on you, and we've talked a little bit a couple of times too, so I know, I know a couple of answers, but one thing I don't know the answer to is you've been an independent entrepreneur type your entire life. Where, where, where did that come from? Did you, you know, mama kick you out of the nest when you were, when you were a baby and tell you to fly or, or what? No, if anything, my, I was raised mostly by my dad, um, although my parents are actually celebrating their 60th anniversary this year. They claim the secret to their long and happy relationship is living on separate continents, which they've done since I was seven. So, um, you know, there's your relationship advice for the uh, podcast. Um, <laughs> we are so, recording this on Valentine's Day. Yes. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> As happy you say, Valentine's happy Valentine's Day. Day. <laughs> No, I, um, I, I really attribute it to my dad saying that I could be anything I wanted to be, but I didn't plan on being a businesswoman. I didn't plan on being an entrepreneur. In fact, if you had said that word to me in high school, I would have said, oh, that's scary. All I wanted in my life was to be an actress. And I went to college on a theater scholarship, and I was sure that was my life. Only I um, was working um, with some people during the early 90s, and um, uh, interactive media was just coming out. So we started a company together, the company took off. We ended up making the world's first interactive movies. But for me, because they made me president of the company and it was literally almost like, uh, you're gonna be this, so uh, what are we gonna make Hallie? Uh, let's, let's see, let's, let's make her the president, yeah. Well, it turned out that made me basically chief cook and bottle washer. So I got, uh, it was like getting a business degree, a film degree, and a degree from the University of Hard Knocks all at the same time. And so that was how I started my first company. Now I'm what you would call unemployable. <laughs> like I've been running businesses <laughs> for so long. Like I don't think anybody could actually hire me. But of course now I get to coach like all these different industries. And so, you know, 30 plus years of being an entrepreneur has finally come around full circle. So yeah, I'm even using my theater degree because I'm on camera all the freaking time. So it's the, <laughs> like, it's, it's all, it's all been a good thing. Aside from just the, you know, being in front of the camera and being comfortable there, what kind of more, maybe more obscure things do you use from your theater degree or from that side of your passions and your entrepreneurial as aspects? Oh, that's an interesting question. So um, when you, when you're in the theater as an actor, you're always looking for what's the motivation, right? Why mm -hmm. is the actor saying, why is the character saying something? Not just like, you know, say the lines, but why are they saying it? What are the emotions behind that? Well, as a coach, that's really the question is, what's the question behind the question? Like, for example, um, a lot of people show up very angry, right? Well, anger comes from mm -hmm. fear and fear comes from pain. So how did that person get hurt when they were like a little kid that's carried over into their whole lives? If you have that key, like, you know how we're always saying like, be kind and, you know, kindness would help. And if everybody would just be nice, like the world would be a better place. Well, the expression is hurt people, hurt people. And yep. most people who are, you know, jerks about the way they show up in the world. And I'm talking about you know, everybody from like the guy who snaps at you in the grocery line to Vladimir Putin, those mm -hmm. people have been hurt a lot as children and they've shown up like with that armor. So I think that was that that's really an insight is like, how can you 
really like recognize that everybody has a, a hurt six-year-old inside of them. And so when you're acting and you're looking for the motivation, sometimes they ask you to like write the character's backstory. And so you're writing about what was their childhood like? How did they grow up? And you're filling in the blanks. It may not be the truth, but it makes you understand why they would say what they would say. And so it helps you really to connect with the character, which is kind of like connecting with the people. So that's how I see it similar. I, nobody's ever asked me that question, Cam. That's a good question. <laughs> All right. You got yeah, it. you just go ahead and do it just so we got it. All right. Five, four, three, two, one, action. Hey, so I was wondering, uh, that gummit, that was just too funny. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, folks, we had a technical difficulty, and we came back in, and I just got to gotta call Camden out. This five, four, three, two, one. I mean, what is this, NASA? We're going to do a rocket launch? Uh, <laughs> you asked I mean, him for a countdown, dude. I don't, have, I don't have the theater degree. <laughs> Holly, wait, I got to ask the question then. Holly, what's the proper countdown then if we're, if we're on the camera here? <laughs> I mean, on camera, I would probably just do three, two, one, and you'd be done. But the idea is just to, like, give okay. people pr time to prepare, right? Okay. Oh, well, unless it's, not, unless it's video, slate right and you have to have the thing and that way you know that the, the slate swiping on through <laughs> the job thing exactly yes yes so oh, my bad so I, I was just i was just thinking and you know i'm making fun of myself because uh, a lot of times i jump all over the place but uh today i'm allowing you to jump all over the place and we'll follow but i'm gonna i'm gonna go to a timeline and after your media company you're you create this media company as a chief bottle washer for this mm -hmm. interactive media company. You start writing blogs. And mm -hmm. blogging is, a, is an interesting thing. Uh, people that blog believe they have something to share. And whether it's external or internal. Where, where did yours come from? Intrinsic, mm -hmm. extrinsic. Yeah, that's a good question. Intrinsic for sure. Um, my, uh, this is a good time to mention about my spiritual awakening because really for me, everything stems from there. Um, I was an atheist until I was in my mid thirties. I went to Egypt for the first time. And while I was in Egypt, I had this profound spiritual awakening. Like my life just changed completely in one breath. Um, what I was told was I had a soul and I would never die. And it was like getting it on my cells. So literally there was like, you know, <laughs> BS before spiritual awakening and AS after spiritual awakening. And it wasn't BS. <laughs> it turned out it was super profound. And it, it, it really changed eventually the choices that I made forever. But it also is probably what, what really drove me to start blogging. I, I wrote, see, going back to theater, I wrote my first play when I was nine. Um, I was, uh, hmm. it, it was called, or actually, no, I guess I was, I guess it was about 12. It was called the nine day queen. And it was about lady Jane gray and all the students in my English class performed it. And I directed it and, uh, and it was interesting, but that, I mean, I've really always written and I've always felt comfortable writing and I've always enjoyed writing very, very much. So, um, that was kind of always in the back of my head. And then I didn't do any writing in my media company um, most of the time, but I did, we started with an interactive storytelling magazine and I was writing for that. Like um, one of my, uh, one of my stories was called Tattoo. Uh, and it was about, uh, based on a, a true story about a woman who was a nude model and her boyfriend who had a tattoo almost everywhere on his body. He was named Tiger John and Tiger John had a tattoo of a tiger down his chest. Would you like to guess what the tail was? And um, it was a bizarre <laughs> story because the um, it was a father and son and the father was a tattoo artist. The son's a tattoo artist. Dad had to do the tiger tail. So that was I mean, I just there was like things that you just sort of blew your mind a little bit. But it was an interactive story and you could click on the woman's body and access different pieces of the story, which in those days was revolutionary because nobody had mm. done anything like that before. So it was, you know, it was very cool. But so I was writing throughout that period. And then when I started uh, mm. producing our interactive movies, I was 
doing all of the pieces of film production, except the writing, but a lot of editing. So I actually went into writing screenplays and went to, um, uh, and went into blogging about the same time. And blogging was like, there was no podcasting. There was no YouTube. We were just like, you know, everybody was experimenting or YouTube was like just around, you know, just starting. And, um, that was also a really interesting time to be writing because like, for example, I met Ariana Huffington and she invited me to start writing for Huffington Post. And so I wrote for HuffPost for many years and I had a travel blog because I was always visiting all these amazing places all over the world. But I also got to write for, I probably wrote for like seven or eight travel uh, publications because I was leading tours. And why was I leading tours? Because I wanted to help people with spiritual awakening. And I actually, I mean, you can go to toursandretreats.com. That's the website for our travel business. I actually have a whole second company that, that does tours. I'll be in Egypt next month. It'll be my, I think, 30th trip. So um, I get wow. to, you know, that's part of my life is getting to lead these tours, getting to help people facilitate their spiritual awakening. And it is a real gift to get to do that. It is especially a gift to get to do it in conjunction with spirit, with God, right? With that higher creative mm -hmm. purpose that's inside of all of us. So all of that led to me writing. Um, I did a spiritual travel memoir called Red Goddess Rising, which was about that spiritual awakening and the trips that I've been leading up the Nile ever since. Um, but I've written like four other books and I, um, I stopped blogging when I started podcasting. So um, I just found the visual and interactive medium and being able to like take that and turn that back into words, even though you spoke at first. Uh, also, I do a lot of my writing now as voice to text and then editing is written. So, the, you know, these are choices that you get to make as a writer. But I think that um, we all have something to say. I think where people, they say that 80% of people have a book inside of them. And maybe, you know, 20% of those people are going to get the book out. So it's not a lot. I and mean, that's not a big percentage, even though there's a lot of books published every year, right? But I think it's because people don't realize that what they have to say might not be unique, but the way they have to say it, that is. And so I think when you give yourself permission to be the unique experiencer of that, then share it with the world, that's where your writing is very special, even if it is telling a very similar story than everybody else. They say there's actually only six original stories in the world. So all those movies, mm -hmm. all those books are based on like six original stories. So I've, I think those are like, that's You're like journey, right? That's one of them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, fish out of water, boy yeah. meets girl, boy gets girl, boy loses girl. Ta-da, we just did three of them. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really want to know, did what took you to Egypt that first time? Because that's not, you know, it, it's really kind of cool. I'm yeah. All right. I just have to go back to Zoom. I hate to do that, but no. Well, there's there's others. There's got to be others. There has to be. This can't be the only. All right, there she is back. All right, Camden. Did you hear that? She just cued you in for your startup. Oh, I, so now I three two one off her three two. One. Okay, we're about to leave that in just for the sake of it. <laughs> okay, three, two, one. <laughs> well, I thought you got the question. You make me count it in. All right, I'm just gonna go. <laughs> so, uh, one interesting thing, Hallie, that we've talked with uh, with some guests before when it comes to beliefs, whether it's spiritual and other areas of life is the, the power vacuum type aspect, that when you don't have a belief there, that anything can kind of bleed into that. And I think that when it comes to spirituality and you know, talking about being raised atheist, I think you would have a very interesting perspective on that, of that kind of re what, what some may view as a rejection for the sake of rejection, rather than necessarily building something up. Uh, would, you, would you agree with that logic there? I would agree that a lot of people would agree with that logic. The way I feel about <laughs> it is we need to use our own guidance. We need to use our own intuition. And one of the failures that we've had as humanity 
is by kind of wholesale forgetting to connect to our own internal guidance and our own internal intuition. Mm -hmm. I actually work, I probably have like at least three clients right now who channel. And so channeling is when they um, are receiving information as if they're a radio tuner and the radio station that's coming in is not of this world, right? So um, one of the most famous channels right now is a group called Abraham. Um, but there's the, the, one of the most famous ones is, um, is an entity called Seth. Um, that somebody, Seth, that's uh, a woman uh, named Jane, uh, like started downloading him. Uh, Marianne Williamson um, has done a lot of work with The Course of Miracles. The Course of Miracles was downloaded. You now, The Course of Miracles supposedly is channeled by Jesus, but it was channeled through a woman who was a Jewish atheist, ironically. She was the mm -hmm. last person in the world to believe in Jesus. She was super annoyed, but this stuff started coming through her wholesale, and she was like, better write this down, and that's what The Course of Miracles was. So there are a lot of examples of history of people getting that kind of channeled guidance but of all the the guy the, the people that I work with who are channels, I can tell you they don't trust their intuition really any more than people who don't channel. I'm like, you've got ISIS in your back pocket or you've got Jesus in your back pocket and they're talking to you all the time. You know, most of my clients, whether they're channels or not, will say, oh, yeah, sure. I have my own guidance. I have my own intuition. I just don't listen to it. So it's like, well, mm -hmm. are you, you know... Are, how are you helping yourself? Because I, not, most people don't have that access. I think most people are really asleep in a way, probably not your listeners, but for a lot of people, they're asleep in a way that they're not picking up on that. But if you are picking up on it and you don't listen, you might as well not have it. So I think that's kind of our downfall. Um, and then trying mm -hmm. to logic yourself into or out of that stuff. I mean, I, will, I always say like, I can't explain what happened to me. I can't explain, for example, when I, when I work with people and they ask me like, well, what do you do as a coach? Cause I'm I, like, I'm a transformational wealth coach. And I used to say, I'm a transformational mindset coach. And in both cases, it's like, well, what does that mean exactly? And I tell people, well, my soul talks to your soul and tells me what to tell you. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me. However, it is the process and the simplest way I found of explaining the process. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It's like, we've got to use our own discernment. And, you know, if you think what I just said is BS, that's fine. You know, you see me work for. You know, I think. Oh, it's kind of weird. But, you know, if it was free, I wouldn't be quite as particular. But the fact that we're paying for it and it's doing this, it's like yeah. that's, that's on set, fellas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are back. And you are Trying. recorded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm also going to see if I can free up some memory. Maybe that'll help. So, I, don't I know. think the chapters are a wash on this dead. I'm yeah. realizing I'm looking at my notes and the times are going to be so far off on my chapter notes. I think I'll just try to do something after. Uh, can you can you hit the mark clip too? Yeah, no. So I'm doing the clip still, but oh, the okay. chapters I I just do uh, them in my notes for normal yeah. to put on YouTube. So it's that's all right. Okay. Well, hopefully it's not just me. Anyway, so. nah, hopefully it. I don't we know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Countdown, Camden. So, you do your having... thing now, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a lot of practice. practice We're gonna, are we going to leave all of these in? <laughs> it's interesting because right now it says uh, uploading 37 percent, and it was uploading before it was. Now it says 43. It seems to be going up. But before it was like 99, 97, 99, 97. And then I got caught up with what I was saying and, that's, and forgot. To that's look. the thing. The, the only problem I feel like I can accurately like diagnose with Riverside is when I see the upload lagging behind, it means it's an internet problem and it's too much going on at once. But that's not happening with you. Your upload's perfect and then it just stops. Like, it mm -hmm. makes no sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully it'll go above that. It's at 54% mm -hmm. now. So hopefully it'll keep climbing. Okay. It will. 
All right. Make a note when I'm starting. And three, two, one. So, Hallie, I'm really interested. Some of the things you were talking about there reminds me of uh, some of the reading I've done lately of uh, Frank Knight. And he's an economist and philosopher. And one of the things he talks about is that when it comes to, especially in the area of economics, but you can apply this to basically anything that has to do with people a lot of the times, is he talks about what he defines as these meta metaphysical forces. And... But uh, the comparison he uses a lot for them is he goes, he draws the economic comparison to physics to where it's, you know, we can have these forces in physics where we know that an object is enacting on another object and it's going to cause this to happen, but we don't exactly know what the thing in the middle is. And we don't need to know exactly what it is. We can tell the math of how it works, but we don't know exactly what it is. And I think one of the things we're talking about there when it comes to, you know, the, the spirituality and the ideas and these kind of things is that metaphysical, that it's there's something there and whether it's somebody channeling it or whether that was secretly a thought that they had 15 years ago and it's now popping up or whatever those things are, that the definition of it doesn't matter as much as the actual force of the thing. And I think that's what's really interesting, what you're talking about there is these are things that everyone has. You know, we're talking about intuition. We're talking about ideas. Whatever whatever the actual word is, the proper definition of whatever's happening inside of our brains that we don't really understand that well, it doesn't matter as much as the actual force that's coming out of it. So what, what I'm curious about is then how do you think people can tap into that force? You know, and, and again, without even going into what it necessarily is as much as, hey, we all have this in intuition. How do we use it? Yeah, I, um, I started studying uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work because I wanted to understand better what I do. So when I work with people, they'll say to me, oh, you remind me of the ones I get normally are either Brene Brown or Joe Dispenza. And when I started studying uh, Dispenza's work, he's you know a former chiropractor. He got caught up by the idea of quantum physics and began asking, mm -hmm. how can we really change not just our lives, but everything that is not working well in our lives? How can we shift that to be more deliberate? Most people, there's, there's two things. There's what happens to you and there's how you respond to what happens to you. And most people don't do a very good job of responding. So, you know, people who attract a lot of drama, for example, are in a loop where they're feeding off of the bad, if you will, energy that comes from a lot of drama. When you go, though, to a higher plane of understanding about what's possible for you, now you can start to impose your will and your desire on what Dispenza and many other quantum physicists call the quantum field. Um, which, by the way, has been talked about in Eastern philosophy and some Western philosophies for thousands of years. So when you impress your, your, uh, your ideas, your thoughts, your desires upon the formless field, which is what Wallace Waddles, writing 100 years ago, called it, you basically are co-creating your life with your higher power, whatever that is. And then quantum physics again, we're collapsing the field of possibilities into a single directed place. And you collapse enough of those possibilities with your intention, you start to see momentum and you start to see things change. Most people don't know that. Most people aren't studying that. Most people aren't paying attention to that. Most people are hoping they have a really good weekend and that they don't get the big C word. Right. So it, it, you know, like when you are living an intentional life, you're not just hoping that bad things don't happen and you can react to the things that do happen. Well, you're starting to say, how can I craft and how can I co-create something better by my intention, by my desire? And while we do a very crappy job with our children trying to fit them all into the boxes that are comfortable or trying to, you know, find programs like No Child Left Behind, which left a lot of extra children behind. All that kind of stuff causes us to be very, uh, which causes us to shut down the basics of our intuition. Like if you talk to little kids, sometimes little there's, there's stories like this all over the internet where moms are like, you know, my kid said he saw 
you know, uh, somebody in the room with me and then they get scared and they're like, oh, that didn't actually happen. Well, what you're basically doing is shutting down that intuition to the point where by the time we're six or seven, most of us are no longer, unless we have a, a parent or another person in our lives who's influencing us in a different direction, we're just not open to that kind of stuff anymore. So when we get to a place where we start asking those existential questions, we can now say, okay, well, how do I want things to be for me? And then we can start on that study of let's make this a great experience for our future, for our lives. And now we can start affecting on purpose. And I think that that's really, again, coming back to our intuition, like just get connected with that still small voice inside of you that wants to give you all the right answers. That's a really, really good place to start. I wanted to, I wanted to jump, jump sideways here for a second because one, yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the things I was, I was thinking uh, in this, and I go back to, you said uh, 80% of people have a story to tell. And truthfully, I think it's, I think it's a hundred percent, but only 20% actually say it. How do you, with, with all this knowledge and you've written five books, you're a blogger, all these things to share, all these answers and, and different pieces going on in, in that head. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was going to say pee head, but, you know, I didn't want to. No, you go right ahead. I don't mind. I've been called worse. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, all that stuff up there, how do you, for others, you know, in in a way to help others, too, how do you take all that stuff and you say, this is the thing I want to share about right now, or this is, or that is? How How do you do that? Well, to me, there's basics, right? There's like spirituality 101. I actually want to write a book called Spirituality 101. I also want to write a book called Orchestrations from Above that talks about stories of people's, you know, participation in an orchestration. That's what I believe is that beyond control is orchestration. And um, Mm -hmm. when you want to decide what to share, you want to get the basics out first. That's how I feel about it. And then you want to get to the, um, you know, what the, like when you're a creator, when you're a content creator, it helps to have a content calendar. When I get off the phone with y'all, I'm going to work on three months of content calendar because I just started doing short form videos. And so I've got two minutes or one minute or 30 seconds to share an idea. But um, they say words don't, that myself that's hard to do <laughs> hey, i actually love it it's i mean it's the easiest thing you've ever done because i can write a very good short-term memory so i can write a script and then i can just like film that line the next line the next line mm. because i already have the idea of what the arc is of mm. what i want to share but it comes down to knowing like who's your audience right and what do you want to sh- say to that audience So, for example, if I want to talk to an audience that's Gen Z, I have a different conversation than if I want to talk to an audience that's boomers. Because we have different things that we're going through in our lives, depending on what stage of our lives we're going through. You know, people my age and older, we're talking about our legacy. What do we want to leave behind? What do we want to create for our children or our grandchildren? When you talk to somebody who's, you know, Gen Z, they're like, you know, how do I get a house? And, you know, where do I find the love of my life? And what am I going to do with, you know, about wanting to have kids? Different conversations entirely. So I feel like when we honor who our audience is first, it helps us to, un- and know that we're not talking to everybody all at once, rarely. It helps us to understand who we're going to talk to first, then what do we want to say to them? And then to layer all that stuff on, I, I think a content calendar is, you know, super useful, but also sometimes there are, there are just things that weigh on your heart. Like I wanted to write the spirituality one on one book for a really long time, but I'm reading, I'm just finishing a happy pocket full of money and a happy pocket full of money has all these spiritual principles in it. In fact, of all the books I've ever read, I think this one says it the best. And I go, oh, I'm probably not going to write that book anymore because I just don't think it's necessary. Those words have been stated Mm -hmm. beautifully. 
Whereas I look at orchestrations from above and one, about once a month, like spirit flicks me in the head and goes, Hey, you got to get that book out. Hey, got to get that thing. Cause it's like, I'm being called to it. Um, Elizabeth mm-hmm. Gilbert in big magic talks about the fact that if you've got a story in your head, chances are somebody else has a pretty similar story. And, and like the, it's, it's kind of like in the vastness of the, the universe and, and mm-hmm. whether you pluck it out or somebody else plucks it out. I mean, how do you, how do we get two volcano movies in the same year? Remember when that happened? You know, how did we get two end of the world movies in the same year? Oh, well, that's every year. Never mind. But yeah. it, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's because these ideas are kind of like in the zeitgeist and it's like, who pulls that out of the zeitgeist and puts it on paper first is the one who, you know, gets that story out. Um, but I think that's there for all of us. I think creative energy is there for all of us. Now, this brings to what we're talking about in the green room. And I'm glad I get to say it on camera because it is better this way. Um, Stephen Pressfield, the guy who did the, wrote yeah. The Legend of Bagger Vance, also wrote this incredible book called The War of Art. And if you would like your ass personally kicked by Stephen Pressfield, read <laughs> that book yeah. because it's about the discipline of everything like everything and the stuff that you know there's like a whole section on resistance and what will get in the way of your discipline um i wrote my first book on the potty five minutes a day it was all the time i could find because i was in a you know had a struggling business there's nothing wrong with that the book was really good when i was finished but it took me a year that way It didn't matter. It also gave me the discipline of making that choice every single morning for five minutes. That is, I think, what's more important. Like in my coaching work, I believe now that discipline is the structure that will get you the results that you desire. Not the kind of boot camp discipline or if you need to like go take ice baths or do 75 hard or whatever, enjoy if that's your thing. But putting structures in your life, what I call working out at the spiritual gym, prayer and meditation and and reading and physically moving your body and stretching and and being in gratitude every morning and journaling, all those things help you to have these really great structures, which will help you come from a good place of creating your intentions, of making your business and your personal life amazing. And so I feel like it's those structures that are the disciplines that will make you a better writer or a better content creator or a better, you know, entrepreneur or whatever else it is that you'd like to do. Earlier yeah, on, it's, the, uh, go ahead. the habits, you know, and, and James Clear talks about this in, in his book, Atomic Habits, uh, quite a bit, but it's not the habits that, that make who you are is the systems. It's the processes yeah. that you have and the routines you have in your life that truly make who you are. So yeah, a great, great way of looking at it. And, you know, Holly, earlier you had mentioned when we asked about where does the writing come from and, uh, for blogging, you had said intrinsic. Uh, would you say that the writing you're doing now is still in that intrinsic or do you think it's shifted at all to the extrinsic side as far as the inspiration for the writing? Hmm. Well, so I started working on the sequel to Red Goddess, Re- um, Red Goddess Rising a couple of years ago. Um, so after my spiritual awakening, I, you know, I, I started the spiritual travel company and I began to, you know, lead all these tours. And, um, and then on my, I, so I started doing these Eat, Pray, Love tours in Bali. And on my 10th Eat, Pray, Love tour, I met this woman and I fell crazy in love with her on the trip, which was so bizarre to me more than anyone in else, because here I was with what I thought was my soulmate, who I was going to stay with the rest of my life, who was a man. And so I, I was so just crazy and confused and, but also, you know, teenager in love. And I ended up moving 3000 miles across the country to live with her in Miami. We're going back to Bali this summer to celebrate 10 years together. So it's been quite the road. And it's what led me to be a coach. It's what led me to really be more me. Like I was the woman behind the man, but every time I tried to step out in front, he had something to say about it. And so Mm -hmm. where she is like, you know, my best cheerleader. So I've been able to really be out in front, living the life that I want, choosing to create a platform for myself, et cetera, which is still in development, but I'm getting there. So 
when I think in terms of like my writing, I want to tell that story. There are a lot of women going through some version of a midlife crisis that leads to them finding themselves, finding their way home. And I don't mean like their sexuality or anything like that. You know, I think you just fall in love with the person, but more like, you know, making choices that are really in alignment with, with the, the dreams that you have in your life. And so I really, really, really want to write that story. I wrote 50 pages. I stopped in the middle of the pandemic. I haven't written a word since. There's been other stuff going on. There's been other stuff. In fact, I wrote another book in the middle of it because that like needed to be done first. And I was like, oh, I'll come back to this afterwards. Now I'm like thinking, oh, okay, I need to really start writing like an hour a day again, which is my discipline when I'm when I'm really doing it. But I feel like it depends on how like, what is the story that you want to tell? What is the story that you feel like you need to share? And I'm not feeling Red Goddess Reborn is the, the name of the sequel. It came to me right away. I was like, oh, I know what I'm going to do. La, la, la. This should come out really easy. Instead, I'm getting, you know, flicked in the head by spirit going, hey, write, you know, orchestrations from above. Uh, okay. And by the way, my full-time job is not a writer. Like that's my side gig. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you know, it's, it's, it's like you choosing and you deciding when I wrote Red Goddess Rising, I gave up television until the first draft was done. Like I did not watch any TV and I took that time, which was an hour, two hours a day. And that was when I wrote, and that was the choice that I made. So what, what are the disciplines for you based on your life? What are the mm -hmm. choices for you based on your life? Inspiration, I, I will get more good ideas before breakfast than most people will have in, you know, a six month period. But you have to start asking, you know, like it's the, the question that I always ask is what is the cost of this opportunity? And as we get older, we have to start asking that question more and more because, you know, now I have because I almost fell off my bike getting this huge download from what I call the goddess of crypto. I now have a goddess of crypto podcast and I don't want to say I have a degree in economics, but I have a YouTube degree in economics. Like I have been studying that stuff for the last couple of years. I really want to help women understand money. I really want women to stop saying I better marry a rich guy so that I'll be taken care of. I really want women to start seeing and showing up knowing that money is their birthright and it belongs to them. Okay. That's a whole nother book. I might just like glom on a bunch of like podcast episodes and, and write it, but you know, and, and that's another piece of this. And I think it's really important. We all need to understand that, you know, chat GPT and the BARD thing that Google's about to introduce and is just beta testing right now and all those other things, they are changing the face of content creation and the story of how long it's going to take you to get that first draft or the edit or the whatever done. I mean, look, I've tried running more than a page of text through chat GPT, not possible at the moment. It chokes, but so but I, I can chunk something out and say, okay, fix this, fix this, fix this, but it's no way to get like arcs, but we are going to have chat like AI that's giving us story arcs or that's improving our story arcs. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And so it's going to make our stories better. It's also going to make our stories faster. It's going to make our content more prolific. So, you know, these are all just choices. There's going to be some people who are like, I will still write my book by hand on a yellow legal pad, right? And then there's me going, I will voice to text this entire thing if I can get away with it, or, you know, give chat GPT my great idea and then edit it. I don't, you know, as long as your voice is in it, I feel like that's kind of like up to you. But inspiration is always there in the universe, always, always, always. And it's a matter of, are you listening? And that's where mm -hmm. meditating or walking in nature or taking long showers. I know people who download all of their million dollar book ideas in the shower, like whatever works for you, that's the direction you want to be going in. You know, talking what? about the, the, uh, quick one. Yeah. all right, go you know I mean? before we change the subject. Cause you, I, I wrote this down a while ago and you just brought it back up. Why don't people listen to their intuition, to that voice inside their head? What's the, what's the block? that's going on. So there's a part of your brain that's known as the ego and the ego's job is to protect you. What's gotten confused over uh, millennia is the ego used to say, listen, if you leave the cave, the saber tooth tiger will eat you. Don't leave the cave. 
poor person who walked out of the cave to collect flowers and became the example of the saber tooth tiger eating you, right? That sucked. So thanks to her, you know, we learned that stay in the cave, the cave is where you're safe. Well, 3,000 years later or 6,000 years later or whatever, many, many, many millennia later, we have that intrinsically hardwired in a way that says that there's this part of our brain that needs us to stay safe. Well, safe equals stuck, right? Um, Neil Donald Walsh says life begins at the end of your comfort zone, right? So what does that mean? I got to leave the cave and get uncomfortable in order to grow. Any growth, right? George Bernard Shaw said all growth or no, all progress depends upon the unreasonable man, right? I, by the way, I have that quote on my little notebook that I carried around in school when I was 10. And I was determined to be the unreasonable man because I understood you got to expand in order to grow. So you got to decide here what's more important, staying safe or growing. And if you want to hmm. stay, stay safe, you're going to stay su stuck. Try saying all that three times fast, even <laughs> as an actor. So if you're, for some people, they grew up in a world where they did not have safety and safety is now the most important thing. Some people are like mm -hmm. that about money. Some people are like that about relationships. Some people are like that about their kids. You know, you get the idea of a helicopter parent because you're trying to keep your kids safe from all the worldly things. So right. we, but you have to allow freedom in order to have growth. And so it's the balance. And I think people don't listen because their egos are trying to keep them safe. And it's not that the ego is a bad thing. I think the person that said, you know, you've got to kill your ego was just wrong. I think you have to master the art of working with your ego because your ego can be harnessed to help immensely. By the way, I think your ego combined with some inspiration is what is writing your book, right? Mm -hmm. or your blog post or your whatever, right? And organizing things for you and, and stuff like that. So I think all of that is really good, but we tend to believe that the ego is the one that gets to run the show. And if you stop that, if you surrender into something greater, your life can be so much more fun and amazing. And so that I think, you know, as I said earlier, beyond control is orchestration and it's the orchestration that is the music of the spheres and so when you give up the control of the small thing to the control of the big thing you know beautiful things happen in your life and that's an experiment in fact there was a book called the surrender experiment where a guy did just that with his life and mm. was guided the entire wrote, wrote about you know being guided for like 50 years and it's really powerful to do that. Yeah. You know, talking, talking a lot about, you know, the inspiration, you know, having your voice in the book uh, makes me think of a conversation we had with uh, Kevin Knebel about a month and a half, two months ago. And one of the things we talked about was this idea of should authors be reluctant? Should it be, should we, is the ideal the reluctant author, just like when we say in the, the comparison there, Hallie, is the reluctant leader. That the person who wants the power of leadership is usually not the right person to have that power versus the person who has it thrust upon them. So that's, that's where that comes from a little bit. But with, uh, with this, what I think is interesting is the way, the way we talked about in that conversation is the, the extrinsic of wanting to help is a powerful thing and that that's a good place to start. But then it's, but then from there, it's when you try to broaden that into, you know, almost the, not, not save the world, but you try to broaden that out to trying to help all of these different people that that's where you lose your voice. And I think the way that I, I like to think about this in my approach is the same way I approach coaching rugby at the younger level, not the higher level as much, but it's that I'm coaching for one kid. I'm always out there for the one kid who can grow up and to go do, you know, and get everything that I want out of it. And if you coach for the one kid, then it works for the hundred kids that are there. But you, if you start focusing on the hundred kids, then you lose that touch that would help to them to bring. Um, and I, so I really just want to throw that over to you. What do you think of that concept of the reluctant author? And then as well as just focusing on the one person versus trying to save them all. Cause we want to help people. We want to save the world, you know, all those kind of things. Those are good things. But if it, cuts down on your product to the point where you're not actually going to be effective, then you kind of reach that point where of diminishing returns, you know? So, okay. So two things come up for me with that. I've never heard the reluctant author idea. Here's I think we thing. coined that in that episode. I think you should <laughs> trademark that the reluctant author.com. 
Um, the thing about being a reluctant author, I think, is very different from being a reluctant leader. I agree with you mm. that the person who wants power is not going to be as effective as the person who has greatness, you know, thrust upon them. Right. So, what I think is important is, is an important distinction here is if I am a if I'm a reluctant author or a power hungry author, someone can still put down my book. Somebody just can say, mm. oh, this doesn't resonate with me. I'm not going to be that best-selling author because people aren't like, oh, he was speaking just to me. And I think that that's important to be aware of. Now, I mentioned Elizabeth Gilbert earlier, and she's one of my touchstones as uh, as a mentor, as a somebody that I admire deeply. And also our lives have mirrored each other's for like the last 20 years in interesting ways. And when I found out about Eat, Pray, Love is she wrote it to her best friend, Rhea, who eventually mm. became her partner before she died. Um, but she just wrote it to Rhea. And yet women came on my Eat, Pray, Love tours for years and said, it was like she was speaking to me. And I get it. It was like she was speaking to me too. So it was interesting because in writing for one she affected hundreds of thousands and millions of women mm. and probably some men along the way as well. So these are just choices that you get to make. But, you know, they say with content that it's important that you write for your niche. But I have begun to, to believe that you want to be so specific that you are simply writing for this client or this client, mm -hmm. or this client. And I think as a, as a coach or as a writer or whatever, I mean, if I'm coaching somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I'm just coaching them. If I'm coaching a group, I'll have this part that kind of gets downloaded that I just like, because that's what I'm hearing to say. But after that, I coach one-on-one -on -one in a group. And it's, mm -hmm. it's like, I see the people the person I'm coaching, like let's say right now there's 50 of us on Zoom together and I'm just right now coaching Otis. Otis becomes the center point of the star, but everyone else is a, is a point on the star. Mm -hmm. Think of it as like an asterisk with as many points as people. And so as I'm coaching Otis through his thing, six people will say, I needed to hear that too. That's mm -hmm. what I couldn't formulate as a question. So it's almost like we're all picking up the same, you know, concepts in the in the ether that's mm -hmm. helping everybody. So I think it's really safe to write for that one person who's your best friend. I think it's really mm -hmm. safe to coach that one kid, knowing that the 99 others watching are going to need it. I think it's really good to coach Otis when there's 50 people in the room. And, and I think what's important is not when you're writing a book, but like if you're, if you're coaching live to set the, you know, create the intention, say to everybody, listen, listening to other people and experiencing what this other listening to or hearing what this other person is going through is going to help you. What do you think all the AA meetings in the world are about? Right. It's like, you're getting that yeah. solace from everybody else in the room, sharing their story, even if you never speak. So I think all of, to me, all of that is, is, is important. And, and as I'm learning to get more specific, I think I'm helping to affect more people. Oh, the irony, right? But I think that's, that's absolutely right, Cam. I, I think there's, there's something interesting there, and I'll tie this back to our caveman survival and the, and the saber-toothed tiger, one of my favorite. Don't go behind that rock because that's where the tiger is, right? Uh, yeah, I've, I've always used that metaphor. But we hear and we seek out what we need, even in our subconscious. Right. So if, if you are coaching me and there's 25 other people, they may not hear the exact same thing that I need, but they hear what they need in that action. I think that's a powerful, you know, it reminds me of, uh, you know, sitting in church and hearing the sermon and going, dang, Bob, did you, did you write that sermon yeah. targeted at me? I mean, it, it's that it's, we hear what we need. And I think that's a powerful thing to remember. Yeah. Because if you listen to a sermon, for example, that's 20 minutes, you cannot possibly take in all 20 minutes of that information. You might pick up three or four nuggets, which might be different 
from the nuggets that, you know, Cam is, is hearing sitting right mm-hmm. next to you. So mm-hmm. we, yes, we all, we all get what we need and what we want to remember. And I think what most people aren't paying any attention to at all is what we need is often picked up through all six of our senses, right? Our five physical senses and our intuition, you know, the body as GPS. And I think when you listen to your body, when you listen to that knot in your stomach or that, you know, that palpitation um, that saying to you, hey, there's something big happening here, because I think often the feeling of fear gets confused with the feeling of, you know, fear of danger gets confused with fear of the unknown, right? And right. fear of the unknown is actually like raise your sword and run into battle fear. And so when you feel that and you are tuned into what's going on in your body, it can be immensely helpful. I think there's a lot of people self-medicating with alcohol, drugs, television, a whole bunch of stuff because they're afraid to be in touch with their bodies. So I think that when you are getting that information and you are embodying it, and then you're responding to the world based on that, you're really, really on your way. That in combined with, you know, listening, right? Listening to that still small voice. Uh, I just want to, before you wrap that, I just want to add one thing on that of just the, I think when it comes to, we, we can understand ourselves and everything else, uh, this is another Frank and I quote, but it's every, everything else is just a projection of what we understand about ourselves. You know, we, I, I, I assume you two feel feelings because I feel feelings and like that type of thing. And I think when it comes to thought and the bigger things that we're talking about here, I think there's that same, uh, there's that same natural like evolution there of it's. You know, just like we talked about the evolution of, of feelings of, you know, you're scared, so then you become angry and these type of things that you get the same kind of natural evolution when it comes to thought of I can put two and two together. So I see four. And so then I start thinking, who, if I put two on that four, it's going to be six. And everyone else is thinking that, too, because it's the natural growth from what we've seen there. And I think that's such an important piece of why it's so important to not ignore your own thoughts in that situation, but use those as a way of understanding how other people are viewing it. Okay. I like that. <laughs> there we go. I Mark. say yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I don't go back to my military terms, you know, concur, right? Mm-hmm. Concur, move out. <laughs> Man, uh, you know, what I learned, uh, I've, I've been thinking about this because uh, I knew I would take a lot of notes talking to you. Uh, there, there's a couple of things, and, and the number one thing that pops into my head is you never know when God will show up and talk to you, and that's that's like oh crap, because <laughs> you just never know when that's going to happen. I think that's a powerful thing to to keep in mind in our life if you're willing to listen. And then the other one, because I'm I'm doing a bonus, but it's not really a bonus what I learned. But it's more of a challenge. See how I see how I play on my words? Because you know, mm-hmm. dad rules, right? I just make them up as I go along. It's it's be the unreasonable man. Yeah. I think that's a that, that I'm putting that one in my pocket, underlining it, asterisk, and that's the challenge I'm I'm walking away from here is being the unreasonable man. I love Camden, that. Yay. What, Camden, what'd you learn? Uh, that when you're doing a countdown for a video, you should do three, two, one instead of five, four, three, two, one. So I'm now a pro. I'm ready. And faster. <laughs> and faster. I got prime money. Yeah, and, and faster. faster. <laughs> and I got a lot of practice in today. <laughs> <laughs> Allie, what'd you learn? Uh, I mine is a little more technical as well. I learned that I've been on a lot of podcasts, but you guys asked the best questions. And so I'm going to rise to the challenge because when I interview my guests on Goddess of Crypto, I try to, you know, have a very interactive conversation like you guys do. But I feel like you guys went so deep and you weren't afraid to go deep. And I think on sometimes on the podcast, I'm always like, is this like too much for a, you know, for a podcast? But I am going to go deep, deep, deep from now on. So thank you guys for that inspiration. Mm, I love that. I love that. How do folks find you? Uh, sign up for that next trip. Maybe not this one, but the next time you're going to Egypt, learn more about what you got going on. 
Well, the best way to find me and the probably the easiest way is to go to HallieMoney.com. So H-A-L-L-E, like Halle Berry, HallieMoney.com. I have a freebie on there called The New Energy of Money, which mm. is about what I see as the future of money, the future of, of the way that our financial world is going and how to hedge against that as a person. A lot of spiritual ideas in there as well, but also some practical ones. So I would say HallieMoney.com is the easiest because it's a lot easier than trying to spell Evelyn. Um, and then from there, once you get signed up, you get information about um, all the different things that I do, whether that's tours or uh, coaching or all that stuff. And you'd get a weekly newsletter as well. Mm, I love those weekly newsletters. <laughs> well, lots of mindset coaching on there. So I think people do like them. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I was I was saying that uh, not really in jest because... It's because I write our weekly, weekly newsletter oh. too. On your phone. Yes, so. and I just got I just got subscribed to that, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. Thank you, thank you for that. Well, this is this has been great. We really appreciate uh, you spending time with us and, and patience with our technical difficulties today. Uh, a lot of fun, and uh, man, I can't wait to circle back around and have you back on the show in, in the in the near future. Thank you guys so much. This was really a pleasure. Thank you. Camden, run us out. All right. Thank you all for listening to the Camden Otis Show. And a special thanks to our guest, Hallie Evelyn, for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to pass it along to someone else so they can enjoy it too. Make sure to follow the Camden Otis Show on Facebook and Instagram. And you can watch full videos of the show on our YouTube page. While you're there, make sure you hit that subscribe button too. As always, the full archive of the episodes is available at www.camdenotisshow.com.